topic we're going to be going over today is sepsis. By definition, sepsis is bacteria in your blood. <gasps> oh my goodness, what are you talking about? Yeah, that is the last place you want a bacteria to be. You don't want bacteria in your blood, it's not supposed to be there. That's why we have mucosal defenses, defense, right? To prevent bacteria from going into our bloodstream. But once they get in there, we develop sepsis. But before we go forward, we need to understand the sepsis pathway. Because before the bacteria gets into the blood, we're going to get a little wink wink from the body telling us, watch out, watch out. So what are we going to start with? We're going to start with a systemic, the entire system is affected. Inflammatory response syndrome, which we're going to talk about. What is the definition of SIRS? Well, you have to meet at least two criteria of the following. <gasps> what? We got to meet two of all these criteria to meet SIRS syndrome? Yeah, but before we explain, we need to explain what SIRS really is. We are, that's going to start with the pathophysiology of sepsis. Here, down below, don't laugh, that's my funny little neutrophils, and those are the macrophages. They got guns, yeah, I tell you, they have really big guns, and that is bacteria. So that is a bacteria who has a suicide mission, so we're going to start with a nice little story. So a bacteria was sent to go blow up stuff inside our body. You know bacteria doesn't, they love to destroy things. So they wrapped them up in a bomb, and guess which bacteria it was? It was E. coli. Escherichia coli. And it's all the friends, aside from E. coli, it's all the bacteria that cause sepsis. We're gonna go over that in a minute, but we're gonna just pick E. coli. And around E. coli has all these endotoxins. Now, when bacteria take a sneak peek into the bloodstream, guess what's gonna be activated? Ah, neutrophils are gonna be activated. Monocytes are gonna be activated through interleukins, cytokines, telling them, <laughs> I smell a problem, there's an intruder, when the invader comes in, they put out their guns and they're about to go shut them down. So the neutrophils and the macrophages, they rush inside the bloodstream and this is the beginning of the pathophysiology of sepsis. However, this pa this patients are usually going to start up with a fever, a fever. Alright, so here's the story with fever. I told the story before, I'm going to tell it again. In medicine, right? Anytime you have fever and a location, always remember for you to have a fever, I'm gonna show you my nice little chimney house. Okay? Here's the chimney house, and that's the kitchen. So back in the days, they used to have chimneys. You probably still see houses that have chimneys, and there's always smoke. So let's say you're cooking here inside the kitchen and you burn stuff. Oh, there's so much smoke, it has to go through the chimney. Well, as an observer, when you see the chimney and the smoke coming out, you're like, I think something is burning inside the house. Might want to go check it out. Wait, that is the signal the body sends out. The smoke is the fever. Oh, you start to shake. Oh, you get feverish, you get warm, you get chills. Well, that's the smoke, that's the fever, that's the body's response telling you there's something going on but the kitchen is the location because guess what it's the bacteria that's causing you to have the fever so check this out guys fever and a headache i might have a intracerebral abscess or meningitis <gasps> oh look at that sepsis man if i have fever and meningitis fever a headache fever headache rigid neck ah Guess what? The fever is telling me what's going on. There's a bacterial infection and it's going on inside the head to have a headache. Ah, because it's irritating my meninges. <gasps> Ooh. What about if I have a fever and I have cough and I'm short of breath and I have productive cough? Where it's coming from the <coughs> it's coming from the lungs. Fever, lungs, fever, lungs. Pneumonia. Cough, right? Because I have all this junk made up by the bacteria cooking and cropping and scraping every single little parenchymal inside my lungs and the alveoli are not too happy about that. Check this out. Fever and flank pain. Flank pain. Ah, I might have pilo 
nephritis. <gasps> really? Yeah, because he just told you the fever gave it away. But this is flank pain just gave it away. That's where the bacteria is. If I have fever and redness, erythema, pain. Ah, look at that. Look up on the skin. It's red. It's painful. Cellulitis, staph strep. <gasps> you see? How about fever, right upper quadrant pain? Fever, right upper quadrant pain. Ah, I might have an ascending cholangitis. Can you see how it's giving it away? They literally give it away. Absolutely genius. So, these patients at the beginning of systemic inflammatory response, they will have a temperature greater than 38 or less than 36. Now, the second thing is their heart rate is going to go up. Being, they're gonna be tachycardic. They're gonna have heart rate greater than 90 beats per minute. You need to memorize this. Tachypnea, why is the patient tachypnic and their respiratory rate is greater than 20 beats per minute? So check this out. If the patient is developing systemic inflammatory response syndrome and they start to develop hypotension slowly what happens is they develop metabolic acidosis metabolic acidosis compensation requires you to do what blow out the co2 through your lungs look at that so because you have all these acids build up in your body because what you're undergoing metabolic acidosis because you're what going back to be going to sepsis ah because there's a bacteria is about to cause a problem you have to be tachypnic. Guess what? That explains why your PSCO2 is less than 32, right? Because that's the only way you can get rid of the CO2. Normal CO2 is 40. When you <laughs> hyperventilate, you're gonna blow up most of the CO2. And it's gonna be low. Get it? Good. White count. Now the white count can either be 12,000, which makes sense, right? Because you have a lot of what? Neutrophils and monocytes, macrophages running, running to the spot. They're about to go kill the bacteria. So a lot of them are gonna what? Flow inside your bloodstream. They're gonna go find the source of the infection. However, you might also have less than 4,000 if you're immunocompromised, right? So if you're immunocompromised, have HIV, or you're on chemotherapy drugs, your white count might be really low. You might be leukopenic. So you might develop a leukocytosis or you could be leukopenic. See, greater than 10% bands, bands, that's a left shift. Usually the neutrophils are being rushed out and pushed out. And so you're gonna see bandemia. Literally, immature neutrophils try to get out, try to buy their own guns to go start shooting and killing the bacteria. So, what is the definition of SIRS again? Huh? Before we lose track, you need two, two of this. So if the patient has just a fever, greater than 38, and the heart is up, that is systemic res inflammatory response syndrome. Got it? Two, so you gotta memorize this. Please memorize this. They will ask you one day. In the hospital, you will be pimped. I guarantee you that. This is high, super high yield. Well. So when does the patient become septic? Well, when the patient becomes septic, they develop sepsis, sepsis, not septic, sepsis, when they meet two of this and then we know where the infection is. Remember my story? Here's the sepsis man, fever, headache. So if the patient has meningitis and they have temperature of 38 and the heart rate is 90 or temperature of 38 and the white count is high, guess what? Now they have sepsis. Get it? Get it. Two of the systemic inflammatory response plus we found the infections. We're like, look at you. We found you. Ha! Oh, you got a pneumonia. Oh, you're coughing up a lot of yellow, you know, yellow, you know, brown stuff out of your lungs. Lo and behold, pneumonia plus one or two of this sepsis. Got it? So now let's break down. The pathophysiology of sepsis. When the bacteria sneaks into the blood, the antigens on the 
bomb that these guys wrapped around, right? Gram positive bacteria, they have what? They have a they have a thick self wall made out of what? Peptidoglycan, peptidoglycan. The gram negatives, they have lipo lipopolysaccharides and also the gram positive lipotechoic acid. So the bacteria has different endotoxin surrounding the bacteria. So this is the way I think of sepsis in English. Hmm. So the bacteria's got a lot of junk. Yeah, call it whatever you want, peptidoglycan, who cares? But these are toxins because the body doesn't want it. These toxins are gonna damage the endothelial cell walls, right? The endothelial walls inside the blood vessels are gonna be damaged this is gonna eventually activate the presence of this endotoxin. It's gonna activate your neutrophils, and it's also gonna activate your microphages. Cytokines, interleukins, they're all gonna be flushed into the system. This effect overall will lead to systemic vasodilatation. That's all you really need to know. So all you need to think of from right now, these guys are gonna start shooting and killing the bacteria. The content of the bacteria is gonna leak out. The neutrophils and the macrophages are gonna basically eat up the bacteria in the process. It's a nasty war. And the war is not gonna cause systemic vasodilatation from cytokines and you know, you were into leukins and all this chemical cascade, but the end result is you now get systemic vasodilatation. So you have all your blood vessels in your side, your body, they're gonna be huge and big, huge and big. That is called systemic vasodilatation. When your blood vessels open up and they're not vasoconstricting and they're vasodilating, you develop hypotension, hypotension. What happens to your blood pressure? It's gonna flush down the drain and it's gonna be really, really loud. Does that make sense? Because now all the blood vessels are basically open and they're like, oh, whatever, right? Nitric oxide is gonna contribute to that causing systemic vasodilatation. Then if I have systemic vasodilatation, what's gonna happen to my tissues? They're not gonna be perfused. Uh -huh. Yeah, now they can't get their nutrient. They can't get oxygen. They can't get glucose. And what's gonna happen? You're gonna develop lactic acidosis from anaerobic respiration, right? Because the tissues can get perfusion because hypertension will lead to what? Hyperperfusion, which will lead to organ failure, but also you will develop coagulopathy. So the way I think of it, the coagulopathy, the toxins are damaging the walls of the endothelial cells. When you damage the endothelial cells, what's gonna happen? <gasps> Von Willebrand factor, Platelet is gonna bind, platelet aggregation, this platelet aggregation are gonna form microthrombi, right? You're gonna use up your platelets, you're gonna use up all the coagulation cascade, and all of a sudden you can develop DIC too. So that is serious, that's coagulopathy, that's one of the complications of sepsis. That was just, just how I remember it. It's pretty, pretty easy. So, damaging the endothelial wall just again, endothelial wall damage, eventually you're gonna have Von Willebrand and Von Willebrand with platelet, platelet with fibrin, fibrin, they're gonna block, they're gonna block the blood vessel and now we can't get any perfusion. And what happens to the organ? The organ is gonna get damaged and that's it. But this is sepsis. That is the pathophysiology. Key, hypotension, systemic vasodilatation. Hypotension, systemic vasodilatation. Now let's come back to our sepsis pathway. We were right here, right? We said SIRS plus infection source, we know where the infection, if it's in the lungs, oh, we know where it is, it's sepsis. Now to be, develop severe sepsis, let's see what's gonna happen. You have to have at least one organ failure. Hmm, one organ failure. Well, let's find out which organ Let's see here, right? So I'm not gonna erase the sepsis, man. Let's talk about severe sepsis. By the way, just before we move on, before I forget, there are different kind of bacteria that can actually cause sepsis. We keep saying E. coli, but there's all these other friends. 
aside from E. coli, because E. coli causes a lot of pneumonia, right? Pyelonephritis, staph, aureus, strep, right? Causing cellulitis. We also have Klebsiella. Klebsiella, Ella, Ella, eh, eh, eh. Pseudomonas can cause, so you can get pseudomonas pneumonia that can give you also to develop sepsis. Another bacteria that we probably don't make, streptomonia we already talked about. So these are all his friends that can cause you to develop sepsis. Okay, so don't forget, these are the bacteria so that we make sure for completion's sake, those are the bacteria that causes you to develop sepsis. Now, let's talk about severe sepsis. In severe sepsis, we said you need one organ, one, just one organ to, to be failing. Now, let's talk about what are we going to see? Well, when you develop hypoperfusion and you develop lactic acidosis, huh, let's check your lactate level. Lactate. It's usually going to be greater than 4 millimoles per deciliter. That is key. Lactate will be coming from your tissues because they're hypoperfused and they're converting pyruvate, right? You, you take glucose and convert it to pyruvate, which is now converted into what? Lactate. This lactate is the lactic acid that's produced. Lactic acid. And from the formula, pH equals to bicarb, right? That's the formula we use to calculate acid-base disturbances. Lactic acid is going to be a lot of what? Hi hydrogen ions, which is going to decrease your bicarb, decrease your bicarb because you, you, they try to buffer all this acid produced by your tissues. That in return will decrease the pH of the blood make you develop lactic acidosis. So you always want to check the patient's lactate. That is telling your tissues is being affected. Well, also oligouria. Ha. Huh. Let's talk about that. Oligouria, oligouria, right? And what do we mean by oligouria? Decrease urine output. Usually it's less than 0.5. 0 0.5 milliliter, milliliters per hour, that it, per kilograms per hour, per kilogram per hour. That means you have so much systemic vasodilatation, right? So this is your aorta coming from your heart, and this is your kidneys. Everything is so big, the kidneys is not getting enough perfusion because systemic vasodilatation is the key in severe in sepsis, right? So you develop oligouria and the kidney can't really filter stuff out and you're not peeing up, you have enough urine. What about, you're gonna develop an abrupt change in mental status. Change in mental status. Change in mental status, right? You're gonna be confused, you're gonna be lethargic, you're not gonna know what you're doing. Why? Because the systemic visibility is decreasing perfusion to your brain. So these patients also might develop, they might have mottled skin or dilated capillary refill. Mottled skin or delayed cap refill. Let's explain that. It's all from systemic visibility, right? So if I try to check your capillary refill, it should be nice and red. When I press, it should be white. When I let it go, it should fill back within two seconds and be pinked up again. The problem is because they have so much visibility where you check for a cap refill, you're not gonna get it back. It's gonna be delayed, it's gonna take longer. The patient also might be thrombocytopenic. Thrombocytopenic. Less than 100,000. Usually, platelet count is between 150 to 400,000. This patient, if their platelet count is going down, that's explaining coagulopathy. 
or glopathy because they're using up all their platelets because you're damaging the endothelial wall causing the platelets to stick to the von Willebrand's the fibrin is being made from the, coagula, uh, the coagulation cascade and eventually the platelet count is going to drop this is systemic all, the entire body this patient can also develop acute lung injury which is a R D S or acute lung injury. That's another complication because if the lungs is affected, that's one organ, right? If the brain is affected, that's also mental status, the kidneys affected. So what did we say the definition of severe sepsis? Wait a minute. They have sepsis with one organ failure will give us severe sepsis. If they meet any of this, this patient is in severe sepsis. Well, we're not done. The story continues. Severe sepsis is now going to eventually go into septic shock. Well, we're going to go over and start talking about what septic shock entails.